Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, a cordial welcome to the Game Changer Online Seminar of the International Space Science Institute, ISI in Bern. My name is Michael Rast. I'm the Director uh, of Sciences here at ISI. And uh, for this fourth edition of our new Game Changer series on viewing Earth from space, the changing environment and climate of our planet, I'm very happy and grateful to be able to welcome Professor Jon Johannesson um, from the Nansen Environmental and Remote Sensing Center in, in Bergen in Norway. Uh, Joni is one of the most renowned and famous researchers um, in satellite remote sensing of oceanography and sea ice. Yoni has over 35 experience in that field, and um, he's been focusing on the use of satellite remote sensing to advance the understanding of upper ocean dynamics and air sea ice interactions, which are associated with ocean fronts and, uh, and eddies. Uh, Yoni has also been instrumental in transferring oceanographic research from remote sensing into the operational arena. Uh, starting uh, from ERS and Envisat uh, satellite observations of the ocean now into the Copernicus uh, Sentinel area. Um, Yoni and I have been working together for a few years when, when we were both uh, at ESA ESTEC in the Netherlands. And Yoni is now working also with the Copernicus Marine Environment Monitoring Service, the SEMS. Um, Yoni has co-authored or authored more than 200 scientific papers uh, and far over 100 of those um, are peer-reviewed. Before I hand over to you, Yoni, I just wanted to, to mention that um, participants on the call are kindly asked to put their questions that may occur, occur uh, during the talk into the chat and I will moderate a short question and answer session thereafter. And with that, I think I've made all my points. Again, very grateful that you could make it, that you took the time to be in the seminar. And I would like to hand over, Yoni, the floor is yours. And again, a cordial welcome to ISI. Thank you very much, um, uh, Mike. And um, good afternoon to everyone. Let me just bring forward the screen. Do you see the presentation? Yes, we see that very well. Just okay, has to so go into I'll presentation into, mode. Yeah, I'll put it, it into presenters mode here, and um, then we are ready to go. So first of all, thanks very much, uh, Isi and Mike, for inviting me to give this uh, presentation. Um, it's a um, very um, nice opportunity for, for us at the Nansen Center in Bergen to do this. And I need to acknowledge also my co uh, colleagues here at the Nansen Center, you know, Ulason. Anton Corroso, Laurent Bertino, Pierre Rampal, Igor Iso, Jonathan Rheinlander, and Hella Regan. And in addition, and there's also involving partners from a number of ongoing projects funded by ESA, EC, and the Research Council of Norway. So it's um, capitalizing on accumulated skill and knowledge across a broad range of, of scientists here in Norway and also around in, in Europe. So first of all, we do have the, these uh, uh, observations now that in fact is coming together for more than 40 years, giving us very good uh, ability to look at the um, long time series and in examine trends of the changes. And if we use passive microwave systems to look at the sea ice decline since the um, late 70s up to present, these are the typical curves that you see for a monthly sea ice area anomalies. The trend is nearly 4.7%. And if you project that for the future, you may see possibility for um, um, very low sea ice concentrations um, as we come to 2050 and onwards. And particularly noting the big anomalies that occurs uh, in um, the late uh, summers in August, September typically every year, and particularly since 2008 or so, there are also likelihood that this uh, ice extent in the Arctic Ocean in September periods in some years can even be extremely low before 2050. 
my presentation today will roam around a, a few of the um, um, big challenges that we are faced with. It's connected to the Arctic amplification, which trigger a range of multidisciplinary coupled atmosphere, ocean, sea ice interactive processes and feedback. Uh, these processes and feedbacks occur across a broad range of temporal and spatial scales. And um, I'm not hesitant to saying that reliable quantitative insight of these processes feedbacks are missing. The observing system that we have at hand do have their strength, but also they have their weaknesses. And with multimodal combined data and model driven analysis approach, um, we are gradually uh, attempting to set up digital twins and um, a digital twin for the Arctic is something that is really of high priority. Um, it's still a question whether we have the capability to do it yet. And then um, in the end, I will then sum up and perhaps have a brief view as to where we go from here. But to start, the evidence of the Arctic amplification can be very well exemplified in this figure here. What we see is the time series of sea surface temperature anomalies from the 60s up to um, present or 2020. The blue is for the area north of 64 degrees north, whereas the red is the northern hemisphere. And what we notice is this divergence of these two curves around 1995. From there, there has been a persistence in this divergence, implying that the warming of the surface temperature in the Arctic is much stronger than the warming of the surface temperature global, um, globally in Northern Hemisphere. The um, individual black, uh, uh, blue and red uh, kind of uh, and colors that you see standing across this figure illustrates the magnitude of the, of the uh, divergence and when, with the estimated from a seven years running mean. And one see that we have a very strong red dark colors in the time period around 2010. What does this mean in terms of uh, conditions uh, locally up in the Arctic? Well, compliant with this, we do, have evidence uh, from satellite observations that the presence of old ice has diminished significantly. You see to the left, the March 1985 situation versus in the right or in the middle of March 2018 situation. And in fact, whereas in March 1985, uh, the old ice that has comprised more than four summers or survived more than four summers comprised 33% of the entire Arctic sea ice pack. In comparison and in contrast in 2018, the old ice that had survived four summers comprised just about 1%. This is something that you need to keep in mind when you also look at these, the figure to the right where you have the time series across 40 years. Inside this message of a declining sea ice, there are signals also that is connected to declining sea ice volume, particularly related to the existence of old ice, what we also often call multi-year ice. Okay, so um, today up in the Arctic region, we are faced with an enormous amount of action and interaction. It's illustrated here nicely by this drawing schematic from Hudson et al. in 2012. And if we break it, we can see that above the sea ice surface, the issues are connected with not short wave radiation and not long wave radiation, turbulent fluxes, atmospheric heat transport, the atmospheric temperature profile and precipitation. In the near shore area, there are land surface processes as well as freshwater fluxes that significantly influence this Arctic Ocean Basin.
And in the ocean, now similarly, ocean conditions associated with the ocean heat transport that changes also the temperature and salinity profile in, in the upper layer of the ocean, particularly in the boundary between the, 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 the deep layer and the sea ice. And of course, in the end, the sea ice extent and thickness in itself is part of this. It illustrates something that doesn't have a scale to it per se, but uh, in winter, this may be to some extent relaxed a little bit. The um, sun has disappeared, it's darkness up now for five months or four months. And the dynamics is less sort of involving all of these different scales in, of processes and their interactions. In summer, it's all back again. But it's fair to look at it for today in general and reflect back on what it was maybe in the last century, where the sea ice was much more complete over the entire um, Arctic, meaning that a lot of this um, uh, interactive processes were to some extent limited and um, calmed, so to speak, from the presence of the sea ice that stabilized the atmospheric boundary layer largely, and also made sure that the ocean underneath had a little chance to talk to the atmosphere, so on and so forth. And of key issues today, which we need to bring into this uh, challenge of the action and interactions are maybe the atmospheric boundary layer. This indicate that this change in the atmospheric boundary layer due to the reduction of presence of sea ice has completely changed that, uh, that lower layer in the atmosphere. And hence also therefore the torque to the higher levels of the atmosphere. We have the wind and wave forcing, which today has a very much stronger ability to damage the sea ice than it ever had in the previous century. The tidal forcing here comes into play as well. In the previous century, the sea ice had a tendency to make these ice bridges between islands, straits, and so on and so forth, making it very hard for anything to sort of be transported across these straits because the ice was solid to the land boundaries. That's no longer the case. In other words, tidal forcing has a much easier way now to also take part in the damage of the sea ice. The changes of temporal and spatial scales associated with this is just uh, enormous. Whereas in, before was in a way more connected to the large scale structures, we are today facing this across very broad scales and also into very fine details at local scales associated with sea ice breakup, for instance, which I will come to. The upper ocean changes are also taking place here you know, in a, a variety of ways associated with this, um, not just because of the warming and potentially increasing inflow of Atlantic water, it is also due to the ERC interaction in between the ice flows, which has come to a completely different uh, level. Malt ponds is something completely new that we didn't see much at all in the previous century. And I'm not going to go into it, but biogeochemistry is critically influenced and changed in the presence of these conditions that we are now faced with up in the Arctic Ocean. Just look at this uh, melt pond figure here from picture here from Catherine Hansen at NASA. It's, it, is, it is a beautiful image, but it's sad to see. It's really sad to see. This is not individual ice flows with open water in between. This is more or less melt water on, on a large uh, area of ice. And what it does to the ARC uh, um, ocean interaction in terms of all the complicated and interactive processes I just mentioned is overwhelmingly challenging to understand. From an observational point of view, the satellites that we are using today routinely, both for research, for operational applications, are enormously uh, important. And I'm breaking it down here from sensors, from passive microwave scanner, 
synthetic amplitude radar, altimeter, spectrometer, and infrared radiometer. And you see the given resolution that these sensors typically provide. Uh, note also that the limitations of spectrometer and radiometer associated with the presence of clouds. But we can see crosses here, either straight or crosses in parentheses, or we see some text that fills out uh, some kind of um, uh, issues. And it may look very impressive and, it, and good. And in a large way, it is. But I'd like to point the attention to maybe the bluish area where you see sea ice thickness and snow depth. We are really faced with a major challenge here to get these numbers correct. It's inverted signals that is based on a large amount of, of the assumptions and, and retrievals algorithms in which much of that is also in fact empirical based. We also have uncertainties connected with the melt ponds and we see more and more the presence of waves in the thinning and declining sea ice field that in fact is also pointing to a new force that the sea ice field in the Arctic is now having to be faced with. And that wave, uh, the force associated with the wave propagating into the ice is again a, a, a force that wants to damage the sea ice. Comparably observations of essential variables in the atmosphere, in the ocean and on land, predominantly the particularly the hydrology, are extremely limited and highly unbalanced. This is now the in-situ observing components I'm, I'm thinking of here. It is by no means in a situation where it can match the satellite observations. And it gives us difficulties uh, because it prevents us from detailed quantitative understanding of this broad range of interactive processes and their feedbacks that occurs in the presence of this sea ice um, in the Arctic as we are faced with today. Having said that, that we lack quantitative understanding of the processes, we also have difficulties to properly parameterize this in the existing models that we have. So this is a massive challenge that the community have, have in front of us to come up with opportunities in which we can balance up better the mix combination of satellite and in-city observations. If you take a glance at the World Climate Research Programme's um, identification of major changes, and you put this into the relevance, or consider its relevance for the Arctic, we have seven key issues here. It's melting ice and global consequences. It's clouds circulation and climate sensitivity. It's carbon feedbacks in the climate system. It's weather and climate extremes. It's water for the food baskets of the world. It's regional sea level change and coastal impacts. And it's near climate, near term climate prediction. We can all recognize uh, these. Uh, we, we may recognize some more than others, but all in all, this is a summary of the views by a large amount of, of scientists. Well, they all have influences that is relevant for the Arctic. And the Arctic, in, in fact, is a region in which many of these seven uh, key challenges do have their own regional uh, characteristics. But how reliably can we, in fact, estimate um, based on these seven challenges but there are underneath three distinct cycles in the Earth system, the water cycle, the carbon cycle, and the energy cycle. And with the challenges that we are faced with, are we in a situation that we can provide reliable estimate of these uh, cycles? I'm afraid I have to say no to that today. And we need to seriously join forces across all disciplines of the Earth system science to be able to agree, identify, and prioritize the approach for how we in the future are going to target the ability to close these cycles with uh, reliable accuracy. So I'm going to show you now a um, 
a um, visualization platform just to illustrate a little bit how we can now take benefit of this broad range of satellite observation and situ data that we have at hand. So I will probably have to go out of um, stop sharing and open up sharing again. So give me. Okay. Um, are you able to see this? Yes, we are, Yoni. Thank you. Okay, yes, that's good. So what you see now is the inside of the Arctic Ocean. It's a map of the symmetry in which you can see the three distinct different basins of the Arctic Ocean. If we want to see the sea ice concentrations from passive microwaves, it looks like this. And it's from, a, it's from 25 April uh, this year. So it looks healthy and it looks nice and it looks completely covered. So it's what the Arctic Ocean should be like. It, would, it looks what it was in the 70s, 80s and the 90s. If we want to look at the different ice types from this passive microwave system, it looks like this. So here you have the, the, um, the, the, the ranges of the different ice types is given here in this panel, where you see the young ice is the white, the older ice is the dark, and the grayish is some kind of a transition between. But it is systematically collected every day and we can make these maps. So it is a good thing to have at hand. If I, on the other hand now, uh, provide you with an illustration of the sea ice concentration from our model system, it looks like this. And look at that compared to um, what you see from the passive microwave systems. Resolution in the order of 20 kilometers. Or a CI simulation system, resolution in the order of 10 kilometers. That's a strong difference. Is it due to the resolution? Maybe a little bit, but it is also in fact uh, illustrating some of the um, details that occurs at these fine spatial scales, which the passive microwave system are not able to, to, to obtain a proper view on. So here we need to rely on other satellite sensors and with the daily coverage we now have from SAR systems. Sorry for that. I thought I had put this down. I shall put it completely down. So if you look at the Sentinel SAR coverage on, on a daily basis, it looks like this. So I can click you through here and we can sum up for three days and it's like this. I kept the hole over the Arctic open. The SAR system in fact covers that as well. It's just to illustrate you now the massive amount of data that comes into us every day at different scales and in different sensing variables. We need to blend them together, learn from the combination and do that in, in parallel with user models. And out of that, we are bound to be better in the way we understand things. And I can show you this again with the CI strip from the, from the models. It looks uh, very detailed and illustrate things that we are familiar with. It's not a surprise to see this. And particularly out of the Fram Strait, you see that the velocity of the CI strip accelerates. It's a classical thing. Also to be um, keeping in mind, the more the ice is broken up, the more the ice is subject to motion imposed by the wind and by the currents. So it is a situation whereby this is potentially accelerating perhaps the decline in sea ice extent in the Arctic Ocean in the coming decades. It's not because it's melting away up there. It's because it's destroyed, broken up and transported away by wind and currents. We can also with the model systems like Nextin, we can look at the thickness. So here you see the sea ice thickness and it illustrates something that we've known for a long time. That is that in fact, the amount of thick ice typically found uh, north of the Greenland and the Canadian archipelago is very much less subject to the four, four meters and more uh, as it used to be in the 70s and the 80s. Now it is very scattered. And in fact, it is no longer uh, solid ice, for, uh, land fast ice. It is free to move. And snow on top of this sea ice is one of the big, big challenges for us to understand the, and to estimate sea ice volume. 
So I'll stop this one and go back to the presentation. So coming back to this um, uh, situation where ice is declining, it is thinning and it is subject to a lot more damage than ever before. Here we see the situation in the uh, Arctic Ocean in the fall of uh, 2012. One of the maxima in uh, minimum sea ice extent that was encountered. It led to practically no old ice left in the before sea the coming winter. It was just refrozen or frozen new ice. And that has consequences for uh, things now associated with the forcing field that can destroy ice and wants to destroy ice, but never it has the chance. This is a low pressure system that in fact settled itself in the centralized in the Arctic with consequences for the sea ice situation in the before gyre. It was very stable in terms of its presence over the time period in February, March, 2013. We can now watch the sea ice situation uh, during this period from optical sensing. So here we see now uh, the visible image of the sea ice breakup in the before gyre, and you can see some cloud patterns that is whirling, swirling around. But it gives a very strong impression of the breakup. And um, it is very strongly characterized by an arc-shaped structure that starts to evolve from the Alaskan coast at the Point Barrow and then propagate into the eastwards, uh, um, westward, westwards into the uh, before Jaya. So let's have a look. This ice that had not been broken up before will have very little ability to be moved by the wind and the waves and the currents. The moment it's broken up like this, these forcing fields can act on it and it can start to move it very effectively. You can see if we can do this with our model system. You see here again the, the sort of the arc shape around Point Barrow, and now start to see how that propagate in the same way as the observation um, eastwards into the um, before sea and maintaining this arc shaped structure. So it is fascinating to see that this model, sea ice model here, can manage to do a little bit of a um, simulation that compares interestingly well with what we are observing from the satellite in this case. If we take that into account and we look at now uh, the area associated with the, um, with the, the red line uh, in this uh, insert image, that's 1200 kilometers about. On the top, you see the wind feel uh, over a period of this um, time from um, around 13th of, uh, of February until the 16th of, of March. And you see how the wind varies, but it stays kind of persistent with its um, wind direction, so to speak, largely. Wind speeds up to 18 meters per second maximum. That's displayed in this figure below in this um, um, Hovmuller plot. In the lower plot, what you see is basically the sea ice velocity field that is set up due to this wind forcing that acts on the sea ice field and break it up. And we notice that in the yellow, it is very low, practically um, a few centimeters per second. And then gradually, and you see step-like, it starts to increase and extend over a larger and larger area associated with the breakup. And it reaches velocities up in the 30 or more centimeters per second. That can be moved and it can be transported out of the before gyre. And this is probably part of what we have, have seen in this observation of the, min, of the gradual decline in old ice and presence of ice in general in the Arctic Ocean and before Jaya. You see the lead fraction here, this figure indicating from 1996 to 2020 that in fact, the number of um, uh, breakups and the lead fraction has almost um, doubled uh, from 0. Uh, 
25, 0.125 to 0.250, indicating that this breakup seems to have a much more increased um, visibility and existence over this time period of uh, slightly more than 20 years. At the same time, we can look at the um, uh, mean sea ice thickness in the Beaufort Yaya. And you also notice that expectedly that shows a reversed trend where the thick rise that was typically in the previous century, around two and a half meter or more, is more and more being replaced by thinner and thinner ice that comes down to less than one meter. And you typically can roam around 1.5 and 1.8 meter. Does this have consequences for the ocean circulation? Yes, it has. The moment that the, the before Jaya is known to be an existing um, oceanic uh, uh, circulating feature um, flowing clockwise in the before Jaya. But when the ice is solid and it was also associated with, um, with uh, ice fast, uh, land fast ice, that motion is subject to very strong um, constraint from the ocean up to the sea ice. So it's causing a rapid change in the ocean dynamics from where the core of the clockwise circulation exists up to the sea ice, because the ice doesn't want to move. Then when the ice has been broken up, it is willing to move and know that before Jaya circulation take an action immediately. And it, in fact, we are considering part of this to be also contributing to the spin-up that has been observed in the before Jaya uh, from the period 2003 to 2015. Illustrated here with, uh, in the upper left, you can see uh, um, observations of dynamic topography from in situ data uh, where the, there is an indication of an expansion of the size of the before Jaya from the late 90s up until 2014 in the big red. To the right, you see a model trying to do the same. And in fact, it does it fairly well. There's a very good consistency between the two. Uh, this ocean model uh, then can be used to explore more the dynamics in the upper layer and also to look at the sea surface height from the model point of view and the area covered of that bigger gyre as it has been able to free itself from this constraint of the large um, ice sheet, that ice field that used to be present in the earlier time. So indeed the upper layer ocean in the presence of this weaker sea ice field will in fact be able to manifest itself in the surface much more. That can be expressed in a way also in the sea ice field where you will now start to see when the ice is free to move, it will create vorticity, shear and divergence convergence, which is connected with the dynamics in the upper ocean. Sentinel-1 saw is a fantastic machine to detect the damage of the sea ice. This image is from 14 January 2021, and it shows uh, the coverage as it was for that particular day. The color here is the shear per day. And we see the, 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 the areas where the, there was pink to dark pink bluish structure. The shear is very high and it shoots across large area of the ice field. We are talking thousands of kilometers here that seems to have shears present in certain favorable directions. Well, our next SIM model, which is run here at the Nansen Center under the leadership of Einar Ulason, is the newest model on the, on the platform, so to speak. It has been developed over several years and it is building around a completely new sea ice rheology and mechanical behavior of the sea ice, which is called the Brittle Bingham Maxwell rheology. It has a mesh, a triangular mesh, and it is alone for Lagrangian um, um, modeling of the sea ice drift. The resolution is 10 kilometers. Its time step is 900 seconds. It's coupled to an 
ocean below, which is in our case, the two pass four HICOM ocean model. It's a one-way forcing. So there's no feedback from the ice back on the ocean. There's also one-way forcing from the atmosphere to the sea ice, which is managed through the linkage of the ECMWF. So if we want to see this model now starting to evolve over a period of two months from December 2020 through January 2021, this is what you see. The ice is just illustrating a complete uh, continuous formation of shears in multiple directions and with the complexity and a, a, a kind of a time scale, which is quite astonishing. It happens within uh, a day or two. It can almost completely change. And the, the, how can that be possible? It is because the atmosphere above here uh, through the wind regime does have very large propagating, uh, propagating capabilities. And hence, boom, it's, it's taking the ice where it is. And when the cracks are being formed, the cracks can also run over long distances that doesn't necessarily have to sit underneath the maximum wind field. So when we now have observations of the shear and we have simulations of the shear, it's both time to start to intercompare and find out where are we good and where are we not so good. And one way of doing that is to basically take a maximum cross correlation estimation out of this combined shear, observed and more simulated shear. And this is what is illustrated in this figure where in fact, we then threshold the shear as the, 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 the maximum cross correlation estimates to 0.35 whereby anything above 0.35 is suggesting an acceptable way of simulating the deformation patterns in the CRSV. So it is beautifully possible here to assess the, the, the quality of the simulation model, the next sim simulation models there, by this very powerful observations that is provided by Sentinel-1. The scales are sort of very comparable and uh, and hence it is, it is it's, it's very attractive to use this. But then we can also move on to do um, the simulations with, with and without assimilation. Here you see a simulation without assimilation. And in this case, uh, it illustrates some kind of agreement, but also maybe not so much agreement in other places. On average, this is not the, about 0.35, it's probably more around 0.25. But if we do a simulation here, what happens is immediately that you see that if we invoke a boundary condition or initialize the model with a, um, a field which is observed, um, in this case, the field is observed uh, on the 19th and the 20th, and we take the information on the 19th and we assimilate that. And then we go one day forward in time and we compare the results for the for this combined 1920 illustration here, and the MCC shows now that we are coming up above the uh, the threshold values. There are there are good reasons to say that a lot of this is good. Well, how long can we do this now? Can we do this for five days now? No, we are in fact not able to do that. It's back to a three days probably where we can expect some reasonable the way of simulating this dramatic uh, deformation structure that the sea ice is undergoing. Beyond that, it's, uh, it's not possible. It, it is, as also is illustrated in that animation we saw, the fact that the sea ice deformation is so changing so rapidly from one day to the next due to the forcing field that is imposed on it. So here we have difficulties to, to have a good detailed knowledge of that forcing field with such details that it can be able to stimulate with good uh, values also uh, after three days. Can this be taking us into the next step that we are now uh, all um, um, aiming for to establish the digital twins? Well, yes, we were are probably going to go that way, uh, and in a, in a way, I believe it will be a successful uh, approach. So here you see a, a situation where, well, we do have a model system. That model system has um, a, an ability to simulate CI, CI spread up. 
So we have a forcing field from the atmosphere. The sea ice starts to break up. That immediately will set up uh, leads that will open up. And when leads open up, the sea ice locally there in the leads can start to move easier. Open leads will lead to loss of heat from the ocean. In winter, that will immediately lead to sea ice growth and a change in albedo. So there are mutual feedbacks again on this one, positive feedbacks in the red and negative feedbacks in the blue. So when the leads are opening up and you form new sea ice, that leads to a negative feedback on the sea ice breakup because in fact, this is thin ice and that ice will have very little chance to survive much of a uh, uh, forcing field from the atmosphere. What more can we do here with such a, um, approach on a digital twin, we can now start to compare this model setup with different observation fields. And again, remind you that the in-situ observations are limited, so we have to rely strongly on satellite observations. Synthetic aperture radar is a beautiful one, as I showed, to catch sea ice breakup. Hence, it is leading us into the ability to lead at lead and, and, and fraction and statistics as well as sea ice drift. Aha, so we can then also do what if scenario here. That's what the users want to have. And what scenario or what, what if can we do? Well, we can play with the sea ice uh, mechanical behavior. We can change the initial sea ice conditions in thickness, concentration, and also we can change the forcing field or we can look at the model resolutions. All of this is part of such a game in which we bring together models, observations, advanced um, 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 data-driven interpretation scheme and machine learning to undertake these what-if simulations. So if you look at that here now, sensitivity to different sea ice rheologies, on the top left, you see the brittle uh, uh, Bingham Maxwell uh, properties. In the middle, you have elastic viscous plastic and in the right, you have a modified um, elastic viscous plastic. The two former, the two latter one, were typically the models used in the previous century, and they were very much tailored to 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 the sea ice fields in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s. But we see distinct differences here in terms of the damage lead fraction that we are able to simulate with these different um, um, sea ice rheologies. And also we note that then we have used the same model resolution, the same atmospheric forcing, and we see that because of the change in damage, the formation, we also see immediately changes in velocity of the sea ice field, exactly what we would expect. What if we change the sea ice thickness? On the top here, uh, we have now the lead fraction in terms of how it evolves in terms of thickness of the sea ice. And we notice, as we would expect, that with the thinner ice, the amount of fraction is reaching a maxima, which is beyond what you can have with medium thick ice or with a very thick ice. So it goes in the same direction. The thinner ice will be easier to break up, and hence the lead fraction will grow. The velocity gives the same corresponding signal. This is again for the time period in, in, uh, in February, March, 2013, in this area of the before the IR. So we see again, the velocity increase associated with the, the um, um, thinner ice, uh, presence of thinner ice. Suggesting that are we again facing this situation that the sea ice loss in the Arctic in the future well, it can be due to continuous warming of the ice and the water around, but the fact that it breaks up more and more easily because it's thinning can be the real killer for how to take the ice away from the Arctic Ocean through the wind-driven and current-driven and, and drift. So if we think more about the machine learning approach and data-driven and analytics, here you see now to the upper left, 
passive microwaves at 62 kilometer resolution from OSISAF. The shear in the left and the, the divergence in the, um, uh, uh, in the left uh, center. Then we move to the concentration, also from passive microwaves at 10 kilometer resolution. And at the right, we see the thickness derived from combination of SMOS and cryosat um, uh, at 25 kilometer resolution. So now with these informations and with the next CI ice model, we now start to train and we combine what we can learn from the observations together with what we can benefit from the model. And we establish a trainer, the neural network in which we are creating from all of this, a new estimate of the CR thickness from next sim, where it in fact has taken now into the learning information from these core sub resolution uh, observations. So, very promising and super nice um, ability to play this uh, using observations and models that to some extent has been validated to be in some way consistent and, um, and willing to listen to each other. Other trainings goes for more the classification of the sea ice. And with the Sentinel-1 images again, to the left, you see how complex it can be. <clears throat> In the middle, you have a manual ice chart, which is very sort of smooth and illustrating the large scale change in, in ice from the green uh, to the green and to the pink and, and blue open water. But if we run this through a machine learning as well, we can make a new automatic chart that you see to the right. This has details, which is only visible in the SAR image. And hence, we are coming to a situation where we can take these structures in the SAR image and move them directly into a, a um, high resolution map with very fine details of the sea ice structures, blending it into a very um, um, small and, and uh, ice flows, thicker ice flows and gradually thicker ice flows. And the structures are maintained as well as you see in the SAR image. And these are being fed into the sea ice model as well. So the sea ice model can learn from these observations and invoke that into the, to the model for internal consistency in the model. And then also for, uh, for, for, for um, forecasting. So I will come to my end now. Um, um, but what can we expect from coming new approved satellites? I think we are, uh, we are ready. We are certainly ready. And we have a number of them that's going to be giving us some new ways of looking into this challenging um, um, analysis of the sea ice um, uh, situation. SIMA is one of them, and Rose Al Harmony Sentinel-3 next generation topography and crystal. They are all going to be there. And in fact, some of them like crystal and, um, and SIMA may give us some of the wanted information that we need on the sea ice situations in terms of presence of snow. Summary. Um, this Arctic amplification leads to changes in the atmospheric boundary layer and upper ocean dynamics. That is immediately bringing uh, new uh, issues to the uh, actions and interactions. Increasing abundance and impact of interactive processes and feedback mechanisms um, is, will lead to more frequent or stimulate more frequent sea ice breakup that in turn increases sea ice drift and reduce presence of old sea ice. The observing system is still insufficient to advance, uh, to allow us to advance on a balanced quantitative understanding of the regional earth system in the Arctic, and notably the knowledge of the processes and their interactions and feedbacks. A preliminary version of the digital twin Arctic evidences important capabilities here to undertake this uh, into a new uh, um, level of capabilities to do what if scenario simulations. 
Uh, but the, the big thing is that to advance the digital twin Arctic, we need to further integrate and connect existing and new data and model driven processing into consistent analysis and prediction framework for the regional Arctic, allowing realistic what if scenario building and visualization of benefit to society. Just in closing, there is a, um, I promise to do this for my colleagues in ESA. There is an info day on 9th of June. That is going to present um, a new um, activity in ESA that is evolving around foundation studies. There will be three foundation studies. And these foundation studies has to be global. They have to be multidisciplinary, but they are going to target gap analysis and, um, and merge together across all disciplines some prioritized view as to where and how we might establish a new strategy for this in the future. The relevance of the Arctic in this context goes beyond saying uh, it has its regional characteristics, but it needs to be blended into the global picture. So that's it for me. I'll thank you very much. Thanks very much, Johnny, for a very, very interesting and, and excellent presentation. A lot of new things um, that you showed here and uh, some of uh, the colleagues uh, on the participants list have been uh, able to listen to your presentations last uh, week at the Living Planet Symposium. Fantastic. Johnny, I have a few questions here for you, which I'd, I'd like to read out. The first one is from Einar Svensson. Uh, who asks, from the passive microwave time series, you mentioned the very low concentrations in late summers. Can this be partly a misinterpretation due to the melt ponds? Over to you, Yoni. Well, it's, it's, uh, it's clearly a relevant question. And, um, and, um, and the, the water in the, the, the melt ponds will, of course, have a completely different emissivity and brightness yes. temperature, therefore, compared to the sea ice. So there is a chance that there could be, could be some um, uh, effect of that. Then, on the other hand, the, the resolution is typically uh, 20 kilometers, meaning that uh, I would still feel a little bit uh, um, favoring the presence of the, the still not the melt pond infected ice to to be leading the signals at least in the in the inner part of the of the ice field but it is it is an issue that probably has to be um, better quantified as as Anna is uh, uh, indicating uh, uh, Sara Aparicio uh, just uh, ties in on on Aina's question and just wanted to know um, if you could point to the source where, when they were first reported, those melt ponds, and how far back in time that was, the melt ponds. Yeah, no, they, they, the melt ponds were there when, when Einar and I was in the Arctic Ocean in the, in the 80s, we did, we did see melt ponds, okay. but they were okay. very rare, and they did not occupy large areas of the, of the ice fields. Yeah. Uh, Mark Drinkwater uh, uh, from ESA is asking, you illustrated the improvements from implementing the next SIM model and focused a lot on the improved dynamics and perhaps impact on dynamical thickening, but made limited reference to the impact or importance of snow in the model. We know snow is critical to both regulating the ice thermodynamic growth and to protecting the ice due to albedo. So how does the model treat solid precipitation, snow accumulation, snow redistribution and snow melting? And can the new crystal capability, you referred to it, Joni, in your uh, one but last slide, help guide snow in the sea ice model? Yeah, to, to, to answer the second part of Mark's question first, indeed, the crystal is potentially a very promising satellite to establish this ability to contrast the, the snow on, from sea ice in the, uh, in the backscatter signals. And um, it's been an, um, value, or it's been a development to, to do this over very long, several decades. Uh, and I think 
I think it's still true to, to, to say that what that crystal machine can do is, is essentially targeting the ability to, to estimate the snow volume um, or equivalent snow water, um, um, the snow water equivalent on, on sea ice. So I believe that will do it. When it comes to models today and the way they are managing this, I think it's a very big, um, big uh, uncertainty to it. Um, Leon uh, Shafik is asking, besides uh, um, saying that it's a, an impressive presentation and thanking you, I have a question. What are the timescales of the feedbacks you described in your scheme? I think in your model is what he means. Yeah, it's, it's, it's another relevant question. That, uh, I think from what you saw in the, in the way the sea ice can break up in the presence of very strong forcing, this, this happens from one day to the next. There are large, large uh, changes in the, uh, in the structure and it becomes more and more heterogeneous. So also from what the attempted um, experiments on the assimilation illustrates is that after two or three days, the scale is really going to go down yeah. because the, the, the forcing, uh, without having a very precise way of, of invoking the, 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 the forcing field, we are not managing to do this simulation or this uh, forecast. Yeah. So it is, um, that is one part of the, of the time scale here. The, 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 the space scale is then, of course, the, 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 the size of the leads. It has two dimensions, a cross lead and a long lead. And the long lead dimension is, can be hundreds to thousands of kilometers. The cross lead dimension is from tens of meters to kilometers. Yeah. Um, Joost Heinzenberg is asking, uh, in your video of ice flows across the pole and towards the Fram Strait, there was a 90 degree break boundary in the flow pattern. How can that be? That's a that's a clever catch. I, I forgot to, in fact to to point to that myself. So we, there is indeed this illustration that um, that um, the flow out of the Fram Strait is more out of the Fram Strait in the next sim simulation, whereas in the passive microwave observations, it is more um, across the Fram Strait. Um, I would I would say that um, that um, the next sim simulation here is probably more to trust than the passive microwaves, and it's again related somewhat to the spatial resolution in the passive microwaves. So uh, from the passive microwaves, one are not seeing individual ice flows. One are tracking structures uh, that have some kind of homogeneity across the uh, the um, field of view. And I believe that that's where we're not doing things incorrect compared to the next sim, which has had a forcing from the atmosphere that suggests that it shall go out. The, the, if I'm wrong, uh, it must be because the wind field that is used to force next sim has been wrong. I, I've, I shall check it um, and come back with a <laughs> verification of that. Yeah, that was from Joost Heinzenberg, just, just to the, who posed the question. Um, um, then I have a question here. Uh, wait a second, what happened to that? Um, what role and uh, fraction does the ocean contribute to the Arctic amplification? That's a, a question from Rosby. Yeah, we are, we are investigating that uh, right now, and it's... Uh, it's um, first of all, I think that the Arctic amplification is a chain of, of roles that um, acts. And in again, then they are acting on at the variety of time and space scales. But one issue that we have been explored and are studying in one of these ESA funded study, the Arctalas project, is to do with the atmospheric boundary layer. Why did that split happen so significantly at the uh, around 2000? And whereas the two um, temperature fields before 2000 were more or less um, in the same trend, so to speak, then boom, suddenly there was a big warming uh, acceleration in the Arctic compared to the Northern Hemisphere. Yeah. The Arctic uh, atmospheric boundary layer up to the beginning of this century 
has been very stable. A cold mm. surface and with you know, a bow that did not um, invite for much of a unstable stratification. Okay. Then as we came into this century, the ice starts to melt more. There are melt ponds on the ice. The ice is therefore in a situation, the ice therefore triggers the atmospheric boundary layer stratification, which can go more neutral and in fact can also be unstable. So it's warmer near the surface and in the air above. This has been able to create the significant convective processes in the atmospheric boundary layer. And most of the heating in the Arctic um, um, atmosphere seems to have been accumulated in above the surface, up in the uh, above the geostrophic layer in the atmosphere. So hence, with this increased convective motion in the atmospheric boundary layer, one have been able to take more heat in that upper layer down to the surface and further increase this um, this melting of the of the of the sea ice. Yeah. Uh, Mark wrote in the chat, and I think Mark Rinkor, and uh, that goes back to the previous explanation that you gave and, and the discussion you had with Heinzenberg. Um, deriving streamlines from the gridded velocities also results in numerical artifacts. That was less a question from Mark, but uh, thanks, Mark, for, for, for the statement. From um, Anne Liefermann, I have, do you see any value in IRT high resolution measurements? I'm not sure I understand the question. IRT? Uh, I, I, could it be temperature? Therm yeah. So IRT is infrared temperature, I would guess. Uh, Mark uh, writes thermal infrared, yes. And uh, Arne says thermal infrared. So our IRT was, uh, yeah, infrared temperatures or thermal infrared. No, if, if, um, if we're not to look, I didn't talk any much of that, but the um, high resolution uh, radiometry will of course still have the limitations in the presence of clouds. But sure. if you do not have clouds, it could be a way to start to see the temperature in leads, uh, for instance. And, um, and that would be a, a signal of, of also being able to following perhaps um, the heat, the, the heat flux through the open leads, both the sensible and the latent. So yeah. yes, I believe that that is uh, is issue for 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 valuable contributions to the data and driven analysis. Indeed. Yeah. So Yoni, thank you very much for answering not only for giving the presentation but for answering all the questions. Um, I get, I can't really count them. I get so many thank yous, compliments, and uh, great presentation. Thank you, Yoni, from many of the participants today. Um, um, thanks a million again for being with us and giving us this insight on uh, the dramatic decline in Arctic sea ice that, that we've seen over the last 30 years. And, and I think uh, a lot of us found that extremely interesting and we got a, a, a lot of new information. So thanks again. Before I close, I would like to um, point everyone to the fact that uh, in a week from now, on Thursday again at 1700, we will have our next um, game changer seminar uh, related to climate change entitled Water and Energy Cycles from Satellites from Global to Storm Scales. And next week's seminar will be given by Remy Roca from Lagos in Toulouse, France. Um, but with that, again, Yoni, to you, many, many thanks. It was a very enlightening uh, seminar. And with that, I would like to close uh, today's session and wish everybody a nice evening. Goodbye. Bye.